whatever one you like. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, you, know you, you shouldn't, I mean, it doesn't count as two modules to, re, to watch the same, the same module twice in two different semesters, right? I, you know, once I, I do them, they're archived, and one of the reasons for doing that is sometimes the videotape doesn't work because we don't have any videographer or the sound didn't work or something, and then we can always substitute one from a year before or something, okay? But frankly, if you're not being quizzed on it, who cares if you missed a class, right? You could have gotten sick and you missed a class, right? Is every class critical? No. Is any class critical? Well, hopefully. <laughs> if you're supposed to get a grade, you have to learn something. <laughs> anyway. I remember I have sat through probably 10 different faculty meetings over the last 40 years where the faculty are talking about the, the students' curriculum and how they, they need to learn X. You know, we can't omit this topic in, from the curriculum and, uh, because they can't graduate without knowing such and such. And I point out that, well, you know, the average grade on the quiz is about 60%, so obviously they, there's 40% they don't know. <laughs> so. Uh, must, must not be important to know 100% of everything. And in fact, it's not. The whole purpose of education is not to, actually, I have a quote from Robert Hutchins. Uh, anybody know who Robert Hutchins was? Anyway, he was the president of the University of Chicago and, and then after World War II, and he wrote the great books of the, re or assembled the great books of the Western world. But he, was, he wrote books about education and he was a philosopher on education. And he said, the mind is not a receptacle. Information is not education. Education is what you, is what you remember after everything you've learned has been forgotten. Okay, so one of the reasons I teach in stories or parables uh, is uh, because the only thing I remember from my education is the stories, okay? I don't remember the equations. I just remember the stories they told, right? Anyway, so it's about time. Um, if other people come in, that's fine. But if our two videographers, one of these is going to be videotaped for MITx. So today I'm going to talk about introduction to structural materials uh, as the introduction to this uh, 12 hours of lectures for the course, but also for some modules or mini modules that will be done for the MITx program. So there have been many ways that people have classified materials over hundreds or even thousands of years. Uh, one is, is uh, to think about, one way of classifying them is to think about either structural materials or functional materials. Those are two very broad classifications, but if I do that, it turns out it's important to recognize structural materials are used in very large quantities. In fact, there are four structural materials we'll learn about that are actually used in a billion tons a year, okay? In fact, I have an example of each one of them right here. One is stone, okay? Stone is used at 53 billion tons a year. And if you think about that, um, if you sell stone for only $20 a ton, it might be worth $40 a ton, but that's a $100 billion business worldwide. But it also tends to be sort of a local business because you can't afford at $20 a ton to be transferring, transporting the stone very far, okay? Um, another material, actually the second largest use of structural material is concrete. And this has to be, happens to be a piece of concrete siding for a house, which is actually fairly new material in the last 10 or 15 years. Concrete's not new. The Romans used it. But it's only in recent years that we started making siding for houses. Now, we used to use wood for the side of houses, and the ants and termites would eat it. But then we started using plastic, and it deteriorated in the sun after 20, 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Concrete, we know from the Romans, if you make it properly, will last for thousands of years. 
And it turns out we use over 4 billion tons a year of concrete. Of course, that's not completely fair because a lot of the concrete that we use already has stone in it. It's actually a composite. The next largest is engineered wood product. And of course, we've been using wood products for structural houses and bridges and railroad ties and things for thousands of years. But one of the problems with wood is nature doesn't always grow the trees in a nice uniform way with homogeneous properties. So now we basically glue these things together into an engineered product. And we don't have to have such big trees. We actually will probably talk at some point about the, one of the first energy crises of uh, 400 years ago was the fact that they were tearing down all the big trees in England. And they discovered the New World, and one of the first things they did was come over to the New World and start an ironworks right here in Saugus, Massachusetts because we had big trees, okay, um, so far as that goes. But we'll talk about that. And the, the fourth member of the Billion Ton Per Year Club is basically steel. And so we have, this is the closest thing I have to an I-beam, uh, but the, the I-beam, um, we build bridges and buildings and whatnot. This is a piece of steel from a nuclear submarine hull uh, or actually a test plate for a nuclear submarine. And steel is about 1.6 billion tons a year. But at about $500 a ton, it is the closest thing to a trillion dollar a year economy. Okay? So it turns out the first, actually the person who was richest, the richest person in the world um, to date that we know of, uh, was Andrew Carnegie. He was richer than Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and all these other people um, in constant dollars, okay? And he made his money off steel. And in fact, this department at MIT was known as the metallurgy department. Metallurgy didn't start until the 1880s. Uh, and steel was the thing that built the railroads and it still is one of the primary structural materials, but not the most common, okay? Now we have, so we have structural materials, we also have functional materials, okay? And if we look at functional materials, not that we're gonna spend a lot of time on those, but you know about um, single crystal silicon, okay? This is a piece of silicon single crystal that's been fractured but these things are grown in 16 inch diameter and sliced and they make wafers out of them, make semiconductors out of them. This is a piece of polycrystalline silicon that is solidified over several weeks very slowly, not to make single crystals, but to make very coarse grain polycrystals and this is basically for solar cells. This one's been sawed up with diamond saws. This one is still a single crystal. This is a piece of functional material, it's sapphire. And it's grown the same way, you heat it up to 2,000 degrees centigrade, you melt it, you slowly cool it in the furnace. Uh, you make something that's, we call it a boule of, of sapphire. It's about the size of a big football, okay? It takes about a month to solidify, solidify and you get very big grains. You can so pass this one around, you'll be able to see some of the grains in here. For these two polycrystal materials, we slowly cool them to try to get large grain size because of their functionality. This one, we want a single crystal. We have some single crystals that are structural materials. This is a turbine blade. And this is actually a single crystal because we need the mechanical properties of, we don't want the grain boundaries. Actually, we don't want the grain boundaries in any of these, but we go to large grains to get uh, the fine grain size, okay? This particular single crystal has been cut in two. When they solidify it at 2400 degrees Fahrenheit, they actually create these internal cooling passages. And then they laser or electron beam drill holes in here for cooling channels. Each one of these is worth about $4,000 a piece, and every disc on a turbine has about close to 100. So if you want to know why the, the engine costs five or ten million dollars, you got a million dollars in one disc with the blades, okay? 
Um, <clears throat> now, there are cases where you'd like to have a fine grain material for strength, and here's an example of that. This is copper. It's actually copper with just a little bit of silver in it, only two tenths of a percent or a tenth of a percent to strengthen it. But it had very large grain size. And I was asked one time, I was given all of 48 hours to go to New York where they were making this and they were going to draw it into wire for the Northeast Extension. If you've taken Amtrak and the Accela train between New Haven and Boston, they were putting in the trolley wire. This is the overhead conductor that basically carries the electric current. You need the copper for wear resistance, corrosion resistance, electrical conductivity, but it also has to be a structural material. It has to be strong to be able to be strung along a couple hundred miles. Turns out I was given 48 hours to accept or reject six million dollars worth of this copper. I rejected it and then they had a big fight over it. It turns out what we ended up using, and in fact this is ultra fine grain as opposed to this coarse grain, this was the casting that they wanted to use, but someone else came up, a big copper company with an ultra fine grain product which has tremendous ductility and strength, and in fact that was the big fight. It had too much elongation, okay? How can you have too much elongation for a structural material? Um, so this is actually a tensile specimen, and you can see the, uh, the ductility of the, of the copper. So those are some examples of things that you can look at uh, of different structural materials. Structural materials are used in extremely large volumes, usually measured in tons. Whereas things like that, uh, the sapphire is actually the substrate for a, uh, a uh, LED light. Okay, the gallium nitride that's put on there is actually put onto a sapphire substrate. And so they take these great big bulls of large grain material, slice them up into very small things and use them in gram quantities in an LED. Uh, there are structural materials that are not used in tonnage quantities, such as diamond. This is what's called a diamond pad conditioner. It's nothing more than a steel uh, pad with diamond brazed in the surface. And when you're making semiconductors, you have to use the diamond to polish the semiconductor so that you can lay on another 20 layers of different things. Okay? So this is a structural material. Diamond is one of the few structural materials that has very, very high cost but very low volumes, as opposed to stone, which is used in, in uh, uh, very high volumes at very low cost. So here's a pad conditioner of diamond. Diamond is a very important structural material because it's the hardest material, strongest material known, and it can work any other material. That silicon photocell, this rectangular, that little square cube, or it's not a cube, but anyway, rectangular parallel pipette, I guess, of the silicon was cut with diamond. Okay. Now, what's the next material? The next material in line, after the billion ton per year club, you can take all the plastics in the world, lump them together, and you only get 300 million tons a year. Okay? So this is a piece of polyethylene pipe. It's got yellow stripes on it because they're going to make it into gas pipe. Has the advantage it doesn't corrode. Okay? Whereas the steel pipe they used for 80 years is corroding all the time and creating problems. And we can talk about some of these other structural materials. But structural materials have important properties. They can be strong, usually. They can be ductile. It's a piece of plastic that I can bend into a horseshoe and will not break. Plastics also, different materials, can be brittle. Okay, uh, And we can pass these around and you can look at the the brittle fracture versus the non-brittle fracture in these things. So one of the things that's important in structural materials is the, the tensile strength or the force necessary to fracture it. 
for a given cross-sectional area. But the other thing we learned about 50 years, 60 years ago, after World War II, so we should also be very concerned about toughness of a material. And it turns out you can illustrate toughness um, with just a simple, simple sheet of paper. Now, t a tensile test measures the force of fracture. A uh, toughness test measures the energy of fracture. And that's the difference between the two. For nearly a, well actually, Going back to Galileo, Galileo was one of the first people who ever showed a picture of a tensile test of a material, okay? Um, but it, we learned about the energy of fracture back in the 1920s, and we never really paid too much attention to it because the guy who studied it was studying glass. But then in World War II, we had a problem with ships breaking in two in the middle of the North Atlantic. It's called the Liberty Ships, and we'll talk about them later. But we learned afterwards that you need to have good energy of fracture. You can't have something that's brittle that doesn't absorb energy. So the difference, what, fracture, what we learned about fracture mechanics, I can take a perfect material, like a piece of paper like this, and I can pull on it with several pounds of force. But if I put an imperfection in it, if I put a little notch, it takes ounces, not pounds. So um, that's a measure of toughness. And if something is brittle, if you put it back together, the two halves meet. It's like breaking a coffee cup. You can glue it, glue it back together with crazy glue because all the pieces fit. But if you take a ductile material and you pull it apart, they don't go back together, OK? Because they stretched into form before they did it. So there's lots of properties of these structural materials. Tensile strength, which is the force of fracture. Toughness, which is the energy of fracture. Creep strength, which is high temperature fracture that occurs over long periods of time. Corrosion, many of our structural materials are metals. And one of the Achilles heels of most metals is they corrode. Um, there are other properties such as aesthetics. I happen to like, if you go in my office, I like wood. I have cherry bookcases. I have a cherry desk. I have cherry chairs. OK? So it's a structural material. I could have steel tubes, OK, or a steel sheet for filing cabinets or desks or chairs. But you know, some people like aesthetics of different materials. There are fatigue properties. You take a paper clip and bend it back and forth, cycle it, and you can have problems that it will eventually fail. Uh, functional materials have other properties than mechanical properties. They have to worry about chemical or magnetic or electrical or optical or thermal. And some of these have some pretty amazing properties. And people would say that over the last 50 years, there have been tremendous advances in the functional materials because you, how many chips you can put on a semiconductor or the strength of magnets. These are neodymium iron boron magnets, and I can pass it around. They have little uh, plastic spacers. If you put them together without the plastic spacer, it's not easy to get them apart, but you can. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about the rare earth magnets and, and their strength and, and whatnot. So these functional materials are not the primary things that we're going to talk about, but I will use some examples as we get into things. Another topic that we're going to cover is the, uh, the fact that we cannot just engineer materials like we want anymore. In the old days, you want to build a house, and you build it out of straw, you build it out of wood, you build out of brick, and you can tell the story of the three, three little pigs, right? About which one had better properties for their materials. But today, um, you're going to have neighbors who are going to tell you what you can build your house out of, OK? Um, and there's a paper that I'd ask you to read called The Age of Socioengineering. If you want to be an engineer today, you don't just worry about structural materials. Um, Norm Augustine was an engineer at Martin Marietta, later became chairman of Martin Marietta. Uh, 
he became president of the National Academy of Engineering. He was asked to be science advisor to the president and was, uh, was smart enough to turn it down. Um, but in any case, uh, he's a Princeton grad, but he is on the MIT Corporation. But he talks about the age of structural materials, the mechanical age, the electrical age, the information age. And now today, he gave this talk uh, 25 years ago, the socio-engineering age, where you are going to have to look at different externalities. Externalities in economics are things that the cost of a material or a process or a policy and will impose a cost or benefit that affects someone who did not choose to incur that cost or benefit. Okay, that's what a that's the definition of an externality in economics. Okay, so you can have people who uh, are uh, making something and they're polluting the atmosphere, and so you see the smokestacks there. You can have someone who chooses to smoke uh, in a public facility, and everyone else gets to smoke with them. Okay, but we've changed this age of socio-engineering. You now have to go outside to smoke. Okay, uh, because people have decided that. Uh, you have no right to make us breathe your smoke. Now, there are lots of externalities. There are political externalities. I passed around those uh, neodymium iron boron magnets. And rare earth metals are used in a wide variety of things. They're not really um, that rare. We're call they're called rare earth because uh, they were not easy, they're in the middle of the periodic table and they were not that easy to extract because they have very strong affinity for oxygen. In fact, scandium has the strongest affinity of any metal for oxygen. And scandium, because of its great affinity for oxygen, currently costs about $2,000 a pound and is not used as a structural material. But it could be used at a, about a tenth or two tenths of a percent in the next generation of aluminum alloys for aircraft. Problem is, you put two, a tenth of a percent or two tenths of a percent scandium at $2,000 a pound into an aluminum alloy and you just doubled the price of the aluminum alloy. The scandium is equal, even though it's at one one thousandth or one five hundredth the, the volume of the aluminum alloy, it's that amount of scandium is equal to the rest of the, the alloy. So there's a challenge there. Can we get the scandium from the oxide. These rare earths are not really that rare, but it turns out 97% of the rare earths over the last 25 years have gone to be manufactured in China. Why? China has 36% of all the rare earth reserves. They have 130 million tons. That's not very rare, okay? Um, we have almost as many reserves in the United States of rare earths but it turns out China is willing to manufacture the rare earths and we, for political environmental reasons, have let them do it. Well, they took over 90%, 97% of the market and then they shocked the world in 2010 by essentially cutting off rare earth supplies to Japan. And so all of a sudden Sumitomo and Hitachi and all these people make electronic uh, components that require rare earths, okay? The motors can be reduced in size by about a factor of five or 10. Well, if you're making a rare earth, a motor with rare earths in it, and all of a sudden you can't get rare earths, you can't just all of a sudden make bigger motors and put it in the same car, okay? It doesn't fit, okay? So this was a major shock, and everyone else had given up on producing rare earths. Well, why have they given up on producing rare earths? Well, if you look at uh, what it looks like to make rare earths in China, you can see why we exported the uh, technology. It's filthy, it's dirty, it's environmentally unclean, and we would just soon export our filthy, dirty processes to a third world country. Now, I don't think China would like to be known as a third world country, but in fact, they were willing to do it. And so it was a tremendous shock, and because of that, all kinds of people wanted to start investing in rare earth technology. We weren't going to let the Chinese hold a gun to our head again uh, because it wasn't just Japan, okay? Because 
companies in the United States were buying these things from Hitachi and Toshiba and, and others in Japan. But China really shocked the world economy by refusing to sell their rare earths to, um, to Japan. So all of a sudden there were bills in Congress and there were incentives to open up the old rare earth mines and processing facilities. And there were all kinds of academics who started trying to think of clean ways to make rare earths. And after a few years, well, first of all, after about a year or so, the Chinese under pressure, but also they had achieved their objectives, um, uh, started selling rare earths again to the, to the Japanese, but no one wanted to have the gun uh, pointed at their head again. And so now China no longer has a stranglehold. And what I've learned over my career is it takes about five years. The, uh, I remember in 1973 there was the, Arab, the first Arab oil embargo. And I remember sitting in the gas lines for People would sit for two hours to be able to purchase a tank of gas. Because you couldn't drive your car without gas. And Saudi Arabia and, and other uh, Middle Eastern countries basically said, we're not going to sell you oil. And so the government started creating a strategic petroleum reserve. Companies uh, like utilities that were burning oil to generate electricity decided they were going to be able to use two different energy sources. They'd be able to flip a switch and go from oil to gas to coal or vice versa. So in 1978, five years later, when the Arabs tried the same thing, it was much less effective. People had learned their lesson not to put all your eggs in one basket, okay, which was the oil basket, and they diversified their energy portfolio. Okay, so um, it takes five to ten years to recover from a supply disruption uh, and Ch China no longer has that stranglehold on rare earth materials. Another economic um, externality is um, the Environmental Protection Agency in 1980 decided to do something about cleaning up sites. Okay? And I remember in 1996 or so I was asked to go to a Pennzoil facility in Oil City, Pennsylvania. And uh, basically a welder had been welding on a tank and the tank blew up through the welder across the river, kill, killed her, um, and caused a lot of damage. And I remember going to that facility and looking at it, this tank had been built in 1922. It was old riveted steel. They didn't even know how to weld in 1922. This facility had been built in the 1890s, okay? And here in 1996, 100 years later, it was still operating. And um, they had different economics in the old days. And I'll show you a picture of, of some of that in a second. But basically, I looked at it, and in the, in the tank farm where they have the big tanks storing facilities and stuff, they had crushed stone around the tanks. If you went down one foot, you would strike oil. They had been spilling oil for so long, 100 years, that it was just, the ground was just nothing but oil underneath the stone. And these were relatively small tanks because in the 1920s we didn't use great big tanks like we do today out of welded construction and stuff. And I thought, um, how could Pennzoil, a major oil company, still run this facility? And the second day I was there, I thought about it that night, and I realized they had to run it because they couldn't shut it down. If they shut it down, it would become an EPA uh, Superfund site. The government would force them to come in and pay hundreds of millions of dollars to clean it up. It was cheaper to keep it open, even though it was not economical to keep it open, than it was to pay the cost of shutting it down because of the regulations of the Environmental Protection Agency. Well, it turns out since then, now it's, it's now uh, over 20 years later, this particular oil uh, uh, refinery has been closed because it got two uneconomical, and now it, they have decided to pay the hundreds of millions of dollars to start cleaning it up. But in fact, if you looked at 
the environment um, in Oil City. Oil City is just down the river from Titusville, Pennsylvania, where in 1857 or whatever, Edwin Drake discovered oil, okay? And it turns out, do you know how they transported the oil from Titusville to Oil City? They just floated it on the river, okay? And they'd skim it off at the other end. So the rules have changed. Some of you look a little surprised, okay? Well, I bet you are surprised, okay? Because today, if you see an oil sheen on the water, you know, they're going to bring out all the environmentalists and people will start having a fit. Well, in Oil City, they just skim it off because that was part of work, okay? So uh, the environmental rules have changed over the years. Uh, this lower picture is actually from, I think, one of the oil slicks from the uh, uh, BP Horizon leak and things like that. But we tolerated a lot of different things in the old days. And in fact, there are companies today that um, have serious problems because of what they call legacy costs. Um, the steel companies produce millions of tons of steel and have for 100 years or more than 100 years. And they used to take their slag and other things and just fill, make landfills. Well, that was acceptable when they did it, but it's not acceptable today. And so one of the reasons USX cannot make very much money in the steel business is because they have these legacy costs. And a lot of the companies go out of business because they can't afford the legacy costs of cleaning up what was legal 50 years before. Okay, so you have to kind of look at not just what the costs are to doing, of doing business today, but what the costs are in the future as well. Does anybody have any questions on any of those economic and environmental externalities? There are other types of externalities. There are social ex externalities. And the example I give here is conflict diamonds back in the uh, 25 years ago, a lot of the Diamonds uh, are mined in Angola or the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They're also mined in the Soviet Union and South Africa and stuff. But it turns out they were having a civil war in Angola for about 40 or 50 years. And in order to pay for the civil war, they pressed uh, a lot of the workers or the, the populace, uh, the rebels, just like they did in Colombia and other places, the rebels in order to, to finance their their war against the government in Colombia, they basically sold drugs to the United States. In Angola, they basically forced the people to run the diamond mines and they would take the money from and sell the diamonds on the open market. And you weren't supposed to be able to do that. We supposedly had an embargo on conflict diamonds. But you know, it's pretty hard to tell the difference between a conflict diamond and a non-conflict diamond. There are actually some ways but you have to kind of do some destructive testing on the diamond and that's not very economical. So there's lots of uh, problems with that. Actually, let me jump ahead to another externality of a uh, one here. Here we go. Uh, this is, you know, since I just talked about embargoes, we can talk about embargoes. Right now they're talking about putting stiffer embargoes on North Korea, right? Uh, embargoes don't usually work, okay, so far as that goes. You've got to get everybody to agree to it. And what's in the paper today? In the paper today is the, so the China is worried about the, the North Koreans uh, and is actually considering whether to cut off the energy, which means you're going to turn that into a, uh, a uh, Stone Age country if you cut off the energy supplies to North Korea. It's not far from being Stone Age for the population right now, but if they have nothing to heat their homes for the winter, uh, people will really be not only starving but freezing. Um, but who said they're not going to cooperate? The Soviet Union. Putin says he's going to keep shipping oil to North Korea. Okay, So embargoes don't usually work, but it turns out 40 or 50 years ago, they had a civil war in Rhodesia, and it turns out Rhodesia has the world's best chromium ore. And it is so good, so much better than anyone else's, 
anyone can tell if it came from Rhodesia because no one has anything this good anywhere else in the world. And so they put an embargo because they were having this civil war and it was the same type of thing and you were not supposed to be able to use uh, uh, Rhodesian chromite. Well, it turns out, so you'd buy your chromium ore from somewhere else, but it turns out where did they get it from? They got it from Rhodesia, okay? And they were just passing it through. And you could tell when it got to the steel mill, they knew this was Rhodesian chrome ore. What? You know, according to the paperwork, it came from another country, okay? So most people will find a way around embargoes, and they rarely work. So let me go back to some other externalities. Anybody have any questions about externalities right now? We can look at, uh, again, some things that used to be forbidden but are, are no longer, or uh, used to be permitted but are no longer permitted. And we just had a big hullabaloo it was last summer about the lead in the, in the uh, drinking water in Flint, Michigan, right? Well, um, and everybody actually, uh, Mark, can't remember what his name is, professor at Virginia Tech who I know, um, won an award because he was one of the whistleblowers, okay? Well, he was a whistleblower because what they found is, yes, the water in Michigan was above the EPA requirement level for lead today. It probably would have been within the level 15 years ago. But whenever they learn to um, analyze for lead in water more precisely, the EPA drops the level to the new level that they can monitor. And they say, we don't want any lead in the water. All those mothers who say their children are not doing well in school because they have lead poisoning, well, I don't think it really is lead poisoning. I think some of those kids just have bad genetics, okay? But nonetheless, um, lead will hurt, hurt children. And if you actually look at how much lead we've used over the centuries, um, so they were using lead and refining it into a lead metal back 5,000 years ago, and the Romans used it uh, had lead mines and used it for coinage and other things. And then um, the, uh, the British used to use it and we used to use it. In fact, when I bought my house 40 years ago, it had a lead pipe in the basement, okay? And they used to put all the water through lead pipes. Now people get all upset about having lead solder in the copper pipes. Well, you know, they think it was 1978 or so they outlawed uh, lead in, in, uh, in solders for copper pipes. Um, and now, by law, if you read your water bill, every year they have to send you something telling you what the lead content is in the water that you've been drinking. Okay? But let me tell you that a lot of people have been drinking water that has 10 or 100 times as much lead as the EPA allows. And it wasn't lead, it was actually arsenic, but I remember they built a gold mine in, in uh, Alaska and the, the environmentalists said, you cannot release any, any water from your, you're gonna have river water coming in, you're gonna process the gold, and you must be below something like one part per million of arsenic in the water. Well, the interesting thing is the river coming in had seven parts per million arsenic. So they had to lower the arsenic and put the clean water back into the river that had seven, per, seven ppm. Okay? That was the natural level of lead in that water. So there are environmental problems, but a lot of these things uh, and requirements don't make a, a lot of sense. Okay? Uh, but they are real socio-engineering problems. So, but if you look at this, this is on a log scale. This shows that the amount of lead, they used to mine about 10,000 tons a year back in the time of the Romans, and it dropped. We were up to a million, a hundred times as much. And why are we using it? We still use it in lead acid batteries. There is no substitute for a lead acid battery. If you look at People are doing all kinds of things on battery technology. In 1925, 
a company in Japan named Toyota that made sewing machines. They had never made a car, but they are the successor. Uh, the car company is the successor. Offered a $25 million prize for someone who could come up with a replacement for the lead acid battery, which was used in sewing machines back then. Okay? Um, that $25 million in 1925 was a lot of money. Um, but in any case, uh, no one has come up with that replacement for the lead acid battery, uh, as far as that goes. Other things in lead poisoning, where is it? Where does it come from? Well, lead from the soil, lead painted toys, lead soldered cans. I don't know how many people are eating out of the trash can, but anyway. Um, lead glazed pottery, okay. Um, pewter, the old pewter people used to eat off of. Now we use Britannia metal, which is uh, uh, a tin bismuth alloy, but, but it used to be lead tin, okay, it was pewter, okay, or actually had other things in it. Peeling lead paint, okay. I used to always wonder, why are these kids eating paint? I never ate paint as a kid. Does anyone know why children eat lead paint? Lead oxide is sweet, okay. But we have found other replacements for it. Um, what do we put? What did we use most of the lead oxide? Or in paint, we used a tremendous amount of lead oxide. Um, not because it was sweet, but because it has a very high index of refraction. And it makes white walls white. And even colored walls, it gives them a better sheen. So what do we use today to replace the lead oxide? We use titanium dioxide, which has a higher refractive index than diamond, okay? So if you want to really have a nice diamond ring that really sparkles, you should make it out of titanium dioxide, which is actually too soft. It's not hard. So actually diamonds are better because they don't wear out. But zirconium dioxide is like titanium dioxide, and it's also hard, and so zircon, or not actually zircon, it's a little bit different than pure zirconia. But pure zirconium oxide is actually a better replacement for diamond for jewelry than diamond. However, you know, we could grow artificial diamonds, but De Beers has taught us all that it has to be a real natural diamond, and you have to have those people suffering in Angola in order to, no, I'm sorry, maybe. Um, but De Beers has taught us, mercury, okay? Mercury has been used for thousands of years. It was an interesting material. When I was, uh, when I was an undergraduate student, if you broke a, a mercury thermometer in the lab, you just kind of swept it up and threw it in the trash. Now we have these mercury spill kits, which basically is you put some sulfur on it, and it forms mer mercury sulfide to lower the vapor pressure. Okay, But, I mean, if we used to play with mercury, they'd take some gold ring and put a mercury on it and you could destroy it and make it brittle with liquid metal and brittlement. Um, one of the problems now is fluorescent light bulbs. Fluorescent, we've replaced them now with LEDs, but the fluorescent light bulbs were taking over for the incandescent light bulbs because they use less, ener less energy, but they also had to use some mercury to start. You needed to vaporize, get a metallic vapor that was conductive, and mercury was basically the only thing that worked. Well, now we're using less uh, compact fluorescence. Okay. Anybody have any questions on some of these externalities? There's lots of externalities. Another environmental externality, it turns out for metallurgy, it turns out we know from the stability of the oxides that any oxide in the world can be reduced with carbon. Turns out the thermodynamic stability of burning carbon and oxygen together, or carbon in, in air with oxygen, you'll generate carbon monoxide. And as you go to higher and higher temperatures, the stability of the carbon monoxide becomes greater and greater. As it get more negative, that's the free energy of formation. Carbon monoxide becomes more and more stable, whereas the reduction of the oxide to form the metal goes the other way. And so these lines cross at some point, if you go to high enough temperatures, 
And in fact, the way we make steel in a blast furnace is we get up to 1700 degrees centigrade and there should be, maybe there's not on this one, the iron oxide line, oh there's the iron oxide line, iron oxide, anything above about 400 degrees if everything was pure, but in fact we get better reaction kinetics at 1700 out here where there's a big free energy difference between carbon monoxide and iron, but the problem is that carbon monoxide is going to go into the atmosphere and cause global warming. So what people are trying to do is come up with non-carbon ways, carbon-free ways to make metals. Most of our metals are, have been made traditionally with carbon because of this diagram. But in fact, um, we're spending lots of time, Professor Sadaway in this department has made a career out of using electrochemistry rather than carbon to make metals. Um, maybe the last uh, one for today, or maybe I'll do two, I don't know. Here's a military externality. It turns out one of the major causes of World War II, bringing the United States into World War II, was the fact that we were trying to, we didn't like what some of the things the Japanese were doing. They went into Manchuria, they murdered 10 million people, okay, in Manchuria. We didn't think that was nice. Uh, there were other things they were doing. And we cut off their source of iron and steel scrap. They didn't have a big economy that was generating old metal parts. We did. We had the world's largest economy, and we generated more iron and steel scrap, we still do, than just about anybody in the world. I don't know if China probably hasn't surpassed us, but they might surpass us uh, uh, in a few years. But when we cut off the iron and steel scrap to Japan, we were basically like cutting off the oil to North Korea today. Okay? And so it can be argued the Japanese had no choice. And they bombed Pearl Harbor because they were basically going to starve without the iron and steel scrap. And we cut it off without thinking of what we were doing to them and whether they would get desperate enough to, uh, to attack us, okay? Um, and the last one I'll do is cultural externality, gold. This is the amount of world gold production over time and you can see we have had a tremendous increase in the amount of gold that we produce in the world. Uh, this data is from the U.S. Geological Survey, so it's probably pretty good. Um, what is the inherent value of gold as a product? Very low. Very low. There are very few things that you must have gold and cannot use something else that's much less expensive. Gold is primarily cultural for jewelry. And where is most of the world's gold? Turns out, half of the world's gold that we have mined since the beginning of time is in India. If you go look on Google and it says gold reserves, the United States has the most gold reserves, but that's a small fraction, okay? However million, billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars that we have in gold is almost nothing to what is around the arms and necks of people from India. And here's a picture of a guy. Anybody know who this guy is? Or was? He's wearing a $250,000 gold shirt. shirt. He's a very wealthy Indian, and he decided that he wanted to have a gold shirt, so he had this $250,000 shirt uh, made for him. He became very famous because of that, and someone murdered him because of it. Okay? Uh, so what? So. Uh, moral is, don't go buy $250,000 gold shirts without uh, spending some money on your bodyguards. Okay, any questions? So, tomorrow we will have uh, Simone Bel Belmar. We'll start his lecture. Uh, he will do something on Monday, and I will be back on Tuesday to finish up talking about externalities and regulatory externalities and go into other things. But... <coughs> The point of today is there's lots of other factors that go into selecting materials other than just engineering, okay? And you will find that lots of other people have an opinion on what you should use.
for a material. Okay? So you see a 